Well, for the sermon, you might have seen the, the title on the bulletin, The Healing of the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. The Dead Sea, you can imagine it's a very dry, desolate place. Nothing really grows in that area. It's really something. It's, the air is dry, it's hot, and you go down into the valley where the Dead Sea is, it gets hotter and hotter as you drive. You wouldn't want to walk down to that to that sea. It's just very desolate. It's a place where it's very difficult to find fresh water at all. It does exist in, in certain places where some springs that, that are around in, in the area. You can even read about some of those springs in the Bible. But there are arid mountains, sulfur pits that are in this area. At one time, this place was well watered. There were plenty, there was plenty of fresh water everywhere. It was a good place to raise crops. And today, looking at it, you wouldn't think that, that was even possible the way that it is. It was a place where life could easily be sustained. And the desert landscape now that's taken over, occasionally there are some groupings of trees, and as I mentioned, there are some springs, but they're pretty far apart. Uh, you know, you can't see one from the other, but you'll see occasionally some some hardy plants that will that will try to grow up and uh, but you know not not ones that can really produce any sort of food for, for sustenance now it does seem like a place where nobody's meant to live very few people I think even even live there there might be some who live nearby or close enough to drive in for work and whatnot uh, but it was this area where righteous lot once chose uh, to settle his family. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 13, and we'll read a little bit about the, the situation. There was a little bit of a, a disagreement in the family, and it would be wonderful if every family disagreement could be settled as easily as this one was. Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 7, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So this is where modern-day Israel is, this land of the, the Canaanites, land of Canaan. So in verse 8, So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for, for we are brethren. It would be lovely if it was that easy between families every time. We're brothers, let's get along, let's figure this out. Verse 9, is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Verse 10, And Lot lifted his eyes, and he saw all the plain of Jordan. This is the area where the Dead Sea is. It was called the plain of Jordan. That it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Verse 11, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. And they had peace. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So we know a little bit of this, this uh, area. If, if we're able to look at a map, we can see the land of Canaan. A little bit further east, there's the Dead Sea, and the borders, and now we have modern-day Jordan further east and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. This is that area that we're talking about here. It was a rich, fertile valley where it seems maybe anything could grow. It was once a place that people would desire to live, such as Lot. They'd build their homes, build up cities. There were, there were several cities in this area that had grown up. And this was a place where Lot could feed his plentiful livestock that God had, had Blessed him. But this area was turned into a wasteland at a certain point because of the wickedness of the people who dwelt there in those cities, in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and also the, the surrounding cities, the smaller cities that we don't often hear about. They were also turned into a wasteland. Even to this day, in the, the bottom of the Dead Sea, there is some, uh, some uh, substance that looks some sort of like pitch or, or um, sulfur that, that actually rises up sometimes, floats to the surface, so it's remnants of the, the destruction of these cities. And there were even ten righteous men in any of these cities. 
God himself was considered righteous. We don't know exactly if God considered his family righteous as well. You know, his wife, she had her mind set on staying in that city, and so she turned back and was turned to salt. So let's turn to Genesis 19, and we'll read a little bit of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction. The destruction that God brought onto these cities. In verse, or chapter 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. All this, this plentiful land, these, these crops that the, the people had taken care of and grown, all the, the herds of animals that were there, everything was destroyed. Fire and brimstone came down on that area and destroyed everything. That plain of Jordan is now a desert. It's a place that is very difficult to live. Instead of those ripe fields of grain and pastures, there's a, a body of water that's so salty that it cannot sustain any sort of life. I think there's, I've heard of one creature that might be able to live there, but it can also survive in the vacuum of space. So that one a tiny little microscopic creature. I don't know if they live in the Dead Sea, though. I don't think any, anything can live in this in this salty bar, body of water. And no plants definitely can, can grow there. If you approach the shore of the, the Dead Sea, there are no plants that grow near there unless somebody has brought in some, some good soil and watered it and taken care of them very closely, watching them. But this, this, uh, this the, the sea, the surrounding area, the desert, is a reminder of God's vengeance. It's a reminder to the world of his vengeance upon those who reject him and turn instead to wickedness. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, we're told that God turned these cities into an example. Let's, let's turn there, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. There's a few different places where this is stated in the Bible, but this was supposed to be an example to those around these areas who maybe they watched this fire and brimstone rain down, or they heard about it, or they, they showed up, they wanted to visit their relatives in, in Sodom, they showed up and everything was gone. This is a reminder to not only those people, but to the world. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, which is what God had done. He condemned, condemned those cities to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Anyone who wants to live ungodly, they should look to Sodom and Gomorrah and see that this is what happens to the ungodly. This is what happens when God takes vengeance on those who reject him. You can also read a similar verse in Jude, verse 7. Jude, verse 7 and again, it shows us that it's a reminder for us to flee immorality, to get away from wickedness and sin. The fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah also points forward to the lake of fire that we read about in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We won't turn there, but that fire and brimstone is a reminder of the future fire and brimstone, the lake of fire, where all those who reject God will be placed, and they'll be burnt up, they'll be destroyed and forgotten. But God made a covenant with his people at a certain point. This covenant was for their good. It was to keep them from doing evil so that they might prosper under his loving guidance. That's the purpose of God's covenants. The old covenant had that purpose. The new covenant has that purpose as well. So that his people might prosper under his loving guidance. Now let's turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 29, we'll read about uh, this covenant made between God and his people, but not only just for the people who were alive then, but others who would also come to understand that God is the God of, of everything, that, that he is in control, and he wants good for us, not only the, the, the physical descendants of Abraham. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 14, I make this covenant and this oath 
not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. And this covenant was made with, you say it was made with mankind. There would be destruction, there would be fire and brimstone if they rejected him. And he allows certain people at certain times to understand these covenants. God knows his plan, and this part, even the, the fire and brimstone, that part of uh, destruction, is part of his plan. He knows the, the immediate, he knew the situation of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he also knows the future, and he sees the future. He sees the, the, the benefit of having that destruction to further his plan, to make his plan complete at a certain time. Now, this covenant obviously looks forward to many sons and daughters that God would call, even us. And this, this covenant is meant for us as well. Now let's, let's continue reading here. In verse 20, we see that those who reject God, he, he's not going to spare. Those that, that eventually reject him, he's not going to spare. In verse 20, the Lord would not spare him. So those who, who, um, who sin against him, they're um, a list of, of abominations, it says in verse 17. The Lord would not spare him, those who, who continue to live in these abominations, in these sins. For then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him. And the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. They'll be forgotten. Verse 21, and the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel. I'm talking about his people, his, his, uh, his physical people there, for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land, would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. That's that land that we were talking about, that plain of Jordan. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is a warning to other nations as well, who would go against God. This would happen to them. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, these other surrounding cities that were there that are now destroyed, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. All nations, verse 24, would say, Why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? You really get a sense of that heat, or at least a taste of that heat when you travel to this place. It's very hot. Verse 25, Then people would say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's why. This is why there was such such harshness to be an example to his people because they have forsaken the covenant. They've turned away. The people turn away. This is the, the eventual punishment. Now today, the Dead Sea is seen as a place of, of healing, actually. It's surprising. People go there and they, they bathe in the sea. They rub the mud all over themselves. You know, it's supposed to have benefits to their health. Even though this place was you know, once filled with brimstone and ashes, we don't see as much of that. It's more sand and, and salt now. Every once in a while you see signs of the, the ash and the, the brimstone, the, you know, the, the, the pitch that, that, that bubbles up from the bottom occasionally. But this place is, is seen as a place of healing. Even the climate, that, the hot, dry, consistent climate is supposed to be therapeutic. It has the right amounts of the good and harmful rays of the sun to make it so it's, it's not supposed to be uh, poisonous, it's supposed to be a benefit. So this area even, the, the climate that was there was supposed to be this, this nice, amazing, wonderful area. Even today there are certain elements that are benefits to physical human beings. And there are minerals in the soil, the, the air is beneficial to the lungs, it's good for rejuvenation. It's supposed to be a place where you can go and you know, when you leave, you're younger when you leave. Your body is rejuvenated. But the waters that settle there, that, that, that go down from other places, you can't drink them. They're no good to drink. 
they can't sustain life. Maybe they make your outer body feel okay, but they can't sustain life. The one taste, you won't die if you drink a whole bunch of it. But if you drink this water, you'll absolutely be thirsty again. You'll thirst again. This water cannot sustain you. Um, instead of being you know, cleansing and refreshing, that water is, is bitter, it's stagnant, it doesn't move. It just gets thicker and thicker as it, as it evaporates and as people use it up. And if you accidentally get some in your eyes, it burns terribly. I've done that. I think I did it twice. I don't recommend it. Either time. They tell you, don't put your head in the water. I said, well, I have to try it. I have to try swimming in this, in this water. But don't try it. It hurts terribly. I didn't go blind, thankfully. I think afterwards I could see about as, as well as I could before. So I, I've worn glasses even before I, I, I did that. And no matter the, the health benefits of this, this area, of this uh, Dead Sea, its waters can't sustain life still. There's no life there. And we need water to remain alive. We have to. That's the way that God made us. Our physical bodies are made so that we need water every day. I mean, we can go, I think it's three days, technically, without water, before you die. We can easily go a day, most of us can easily go a day when we fast without water, but we need water to be sustained, for our bodies to, to maintain themselves. But drinking physical water is only good for physical sustenance. Even when we drink the freshest, purest, coolest water, we're still going to thirst again with that physical thirst. Our, our thirst will come back. It will never be quenched. Our real thirst is for something greater, isn't it? It's for something that will last, something that will fill us completely and forever. It's, more, it's a thirst for something more than the physical water that we're provided with. Let's turn to John chapter 4. This was a time when Jesus Christ and his disciples were headed, uh, it says they were headed northward to Galilee from where they were. Galilee is north of the Dead Sea. They were headed northward and they stopped in the, in the city of Samaria. Coincidentally, they stopped for food and water. They had that physical hunger and thirst. They were physical beings. Christ was, was a physical human being with the mind of God. And the water, you know, they, they, uh, they needed that. Now, in, uh, in the city of Samaria, the Samaritans lived there. And Christ stopped and talked to a Samaritan woman. And she had come to this well that was there to get water. She was thirsty as well, you know, a physical human being. John chapter 4 and verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus was there at the same time, he said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And this lady was familiar with the well. She was familiar with the, you know, the, the city. And he asked her to give, give him a drink. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along at all. This history went back even to the, the time of the, the prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah, Haggai and Zechariah, the Samaritans were, were against the Jews, and the Jews were against the Samaritans. They had this back and forth. And the Samaritans were a mixture of nations. Some of them were probably related to the Jew, Jews, or the, the Israelites, the tribes of Israel. But they were brought in from different nations by the kings of Assyria to repopulate the lands that they had taken over. They moved people out, and they brought different people in, strange people, so, so people wouldn't uh, have their own lands. They repopulated these, these cities that way. And they did this with Jerusalem. They repopulated um, that, that capital city of Israel. And the Samaritans actually came to uh, believe that they were part of the nation of Israel. And they went so far as to learn God's laws, they learned his ways, but they mixed them with their former ways, with their pagan beliefs, 
the pagan gods. They had a mixture, a strange mixture. Um, so that's that's why they they believed uh, that they were God's people because they believed in part the truth of God. But they would worship God and their idols both. And there became hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews, both considering themselves to be God's people, but both having similar but different beliefs. And they wouldn't speak to each other. The Jews despised the Samaritans. It was uh, considered awful and, and dirty to talk to Samaritans. But here Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. And she's wondering why he took the time to talk to her, because he's not a respecter of persons. He came not to destroy, but to save men's lives. We can read about that in Luke chapter 9. We won't turn there. Luke 9 verse 56 states that. He came to save men's lives. He wanted to help this woman. And there's a lesson in here for all of us. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water living water. She's still thinking of this physical water because she's thirsty. He's thirsty with his physical thirst, but he's, he's taking, taking this moment to, to teach. Christ always found teachable moments. He was a teacher. In verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? She's thinking, well, this well, you know, we can draw water out of it all day, and we'd still be thirsty. It doesn't you know, it's, it's just water. It's just regular water. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? See, she's, she's, uh, she understands that she's related to, to the Israelites, or at least believes that, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. This well had been there for, for many generations. It was still there providing water, but it's not living water. But Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. This water in this well, they, they will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Everlasting life. This is what we thirst for. He was trying to explain to her that he was the Messiah that she had been waiting for. She knew there was a Messiah coming. She didn't worship God completely in the right way, but she knew certain certain aspects. She knew there was a Messiah coming, and he was the, the true Messiah. And true worshipers of him, of God the Father, are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It goes on to say that in verses 24 and 25. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth having that living water. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He was that Messiah. He came to tell people of that living water that was coming. Now let's turn over to John chapter 7. The water, of course, that Christ spoke of that quenches the thirst that so that we'll never thirst again is God's spirit, God's power, as we heard in the sermonette. His power, his mind, his love, his character. It's the spirit of God the Father and of God the Son. We're told in John 15 that this spirit is the very same spirit that proceeds from the Father. And it's given through Jesus Christ. It says that in Titus chapter 3, and verse 6. It's God's spirit that gives life. And we need that spirit in order to have this everlasting life that Christ talked about. If we want to, to see him clearly, if we want to truly worship him in the right way, and if we want to be like him and have eternal life like him. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, this is the, the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, Christ came and he stood up, and he cried out, and he's teaching people on the feast of the coming of this spiritual living water, God's Holy Spirit, that, that will flow to sustain a spiritual life. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. We can't get that from 
from any other source. No well that we find. There's no fountain of youth out there that's just waiting to be discovered. This is this this fountain that we need to drink from, this well, this living water, but we get it from Christ. We have to go through Him. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The Spirit will, will produce something in us. It will produce more of this, uh, uh, you know, the, the character of God. It's supposed to come out of us. People are supposed to see it. Verse 39, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And we know after he was crucified, he was then glorified. After he went back, he returned to, to, to God the Father two times, actually. This after the second time, then the Holy Spirit was given. It was in that, that time where his disciples saw him go up to the Father in glory. So they had that picture in mind when he left. They didn't have this picture of a crucified Christ. They knew he was crucified. They saw that, but they also saw him with power. Now this living water, God's Spirit, is supposed to dwell in us. It's supposed to guide us, to help us, to live like he would have us to live. And it also makes his covenant more binding with us. Instead of just a physical outward covenant with his nation of Israel, as a spiritual binding covenant where his, his laws are written on our hearts and in our minds so that we remember them. Now, on the day of Pentecost that followed his resurrection, that's when, when the, the Holy Spirit was first poured out to more than just a few individuals, poured out to, to his disciples, and then others were also converted, they were baptized. They were changed, they repented of their sins, and they were given God's Holy Spirit. And we're not going to read Acts chapter 2. I think Mr. Morris was hoping that we'd cover that. But we're going to cover a little bit of the prophecy that, was, that came before Acts chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, there was a prophecy that was partially fulfilled in the book of Acts during that time. It's one of the, the minor prophets, a smaller book, but it doesn't mean it's minor in, in content and importance. To find Joel, I also have to find Hosea first. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Joel chapter 2, in verse 27, this is where this prophecy starts. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. God comforting us, comforting His people. If He's with us, then nobody can, can touch us. Verse 28, and It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out My Spirit on all flesh. After the you know, certain events, in this case it's, it's dual prophecy, partially fulfilled in the book of Acts on that day of Pentecost, but part of it is yet to be fulfilled when God's Spirit will be poured out. And we'll read, read that as well. I will pour out all, my, my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my, ser on, on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days onto His, His, His servants, those who are following Him, who are willing to follow Him. And we are a part of the fulfillment of, part of the, the partial fulfillment of this Scripture as well, because we have the chance to have God's Holy Spirit poured out onto us, into us. So we have a chance to, to be a partial fulfillment of this, this wonderful prophecy. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 44. We're part of the, the first fruits, the first few who have received God's Spirit, but there will be more. There will be more to come. And we talk about this. This brings us comfort. This should bring us great joy that there will be more coming after us. Those around us who, who don't know God's truth, sometimes our families that, uh, that never had the chance to understand these things, who have died, it brings us comfort to know that they'll have the chance to, to learn these things, to have, have the opportunity to accept God to know Him and to have the, this, this chance to have Him 
uh, living in them. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, it's another name for Israel, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. This isn't talking about that physical water. Of course, there will be you know, physical water to feed physical people in the millennium. This is talking about spiritual water and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. This didn't happen to ancient Israel. This happened to uh, Israel, spiritual Israel in the New Testament. And they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob and will write with his hand the Lord's and the name himself and name himself by the name of Israel. So other people who are not called Israel, not called God's people, will be called God's people. It's spiritual Israel, having God's spirit poured out. And many others will have that chance. We are included in that the, the these, these first fruits of the spirit, the spiritual nation. And there will be some who will come out who will be uh, given God's Spirit during the, the Great Tribulation or after the Great Tribulation. They'll realize that God is causing these things to happen, to bring more destruction, to warn people as a reminder. And so they'll turn to Him. Revelation chapter 7. Let's turn there. These people will be thirsty for this, this water that never runs out, this water that makes them never be thirsty again the Spirit of God. And there will be a need of a shepherd to guide them to these waters and to produce these waters, to give them to them so that they can drink of it. Revelation chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So God is going to dwell among people. And they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We look forward to that time. There won't be any more sadness. There will be life instead. There won't be any more destruction. There will be life. There will be good things. And the Lamb, Jesus Christ, will guide people to this water so that they can drink, so that they can be sustained. Now there's a connection here to the Dead Sea. When we read about healing, the Dead Sea, that area right now is still a reminder of the past, a reminder of the destruction that happened. But it's in need of of healing. The cities, that that area in the plain of Jordan, they're a desert and they, they, they can't thrive. They need They need to thrive. They need to grow. They need to to change. There's another prophecy in the book of Joel. And we'll read that. That follows Joel chapter 3. This is Joel Joel chapter 3. It follows Joel chapter 2, of course. Let's see if I can find Joel again. I got it. Found it. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The Lord also will roar from Zion. We have Christ pictured as a, a lion, a powerful lion coming. and He's, he's going to roar and utter His voice from Jerusalem. He will be heard from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for His people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. And no aliens, no, no foreigners shall ever pass through her again. And there will be a time when, when uh, no one will be a foreigner. Everyone will be familiar. Everyone will be part of the, the family of God. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. The hills shall flow with milk. And all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. 
In some, some translations, I, I think it says the valley of Shittim. It's a certain type of tree. It's a, the valley that, that is, I, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, I know it's in Israel. It's near Jerusalem. I, I, I think it's the valley that, that, is, that, that goes from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. I forgot to write that one in there. But it says that water will flow from that, from Jerusalem down into this valley and water everything that needs to grow, that water, to water everything that needs life, that needs that sustenance, that needs to be renewed. Now let's read another portion of, of this prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 47. These prophecies are related. Ezekiel chapter 47 This is one of the, the themes of, of God's plan, the themes of the Bible, is this renewal brought on by God's Spirit. God will renew the earth. When Christ returns, He's going to bring renewal to this earth, to the things that have been destroyed, to the things that will be destroyed. Ezekiel 47, verse 1, this is Ezekiel's vision, Then He brought me back to the door of the temple. He's in Jerusalem. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. So toward, uh, see if I can situate here, toward the east, it was flowing toward the Mount of Olives from, from the temple. And there's a valley between the Mount of Olives and, uh, and Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, where the, the temple is, the Temple Mount. There's a valley there. So the water is flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east toward the Mount of Olives, into this valley. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar, south down, and eventually to this same valley. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the right side. This water that's just running, it's flowing. Now there is... Um, there is a, uh, a river, it's wide and deep here described, flowing from the temple of God on the east side of the temple. Now again, it's flowing into this, this valley. I, did, I wrote down another name for this valley. I found it in my notes. The Kidron Valley, this is called. You might have heard it. It's, it's between the, the, uh, the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. The Kidron Valley. Um, sometimes in scriptures it describes the brook Kidron, a brook that, that flows but right now, there's no brook that flows consistently or constantly into this valley. At least not in Jerusalem, not from Jerusalem. There's, uh, sometimes if there are heavy rains, that brook will be filled with water and the waters will flow. But then, you know, once the dry seasons come, that water is, is gone. It's all dried up. It's usually just during the winter months when it rains in that part of the world. And you can write down in your notes Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 8. We won't turn there, but this is uh, part of that same prophecy of the time when Christ returns to the earth and there will be a restoration. Everything will become His at that time. And that includes uh, you know, those living waters will be, will be flowing from the, the, the temple. In Zechariah 14 verse 8, it says, And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem half of them towards the eastern sea, which is the, the Dead Sea, down into this valley, and half of them towards the western sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So these waters will flow to both of these, these areas. And it says in both summer and winter it shall occur. Water won't just flow sometimes, just in winter. It will flow all the time. This living water, this, this Spirit from God, it won't be dependent on any seasons. It won't be dependent on any, anybody uh, building anything in the way of, of those, those, this stream. It won't be dependent on any uh, springs that are found in the area of the Dead Sea to fill this, 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 uh, this river, the river of living waters. But it will fl flow directly from God's throne. From His throne it will come. From the midst of the temple, God's Holy Spirit will be flowing out. Back in Ezekiel 47, 
In verse 7, it says, When I returned, this is Ezekiel, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. This is a complete contrast to what we see now in this valley of Jordan, in this plain of Jordan, this, uh, you know, the, the Dead Sea Valley. Instead of a place where there's only desert, where, where it's hard to find any sorts of trees, maybe a few shrubs unless there's an oasis somewhere, it says that there will be trees on, on both sides of this river. They'll be able to be sustained. And then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. It enters the Dead Sea. So this is a prophecy about the Dead Sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. This is that connection with the Dead Sea. The healing of the Dead Sea is going to happen. It'll be clean. It'll be pure water that's refreshing. It'll be a place that's ready for life. And life, we see, will, will begin to, to, to happen there. These trees if they're planted there, they will grow, and, and trees and, and plants, all, all sorts of things will start happening. In verse 10, it shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Eglaim. These are certain areas where there are springs right now that are actually far back from the, the shores of the, the sea that's presently there. But people will stand there far back from where the shores are presently. The water will reach them in that area, and they'll be fishing in the Dead Sea. Of course, I doubt it'll be called the Dead Sea anymore. But it'll be, it'll be a, a place where fishermen can go, and they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be the same kinds as the fish of the Great Sea, of the Mediterranean Sea, exceedingly many. There will be hundreds of varieties, just like there are in the Mediterranean Sea. I think there's over 700 varieties of fish there right now in the Med Mediterranean and zero varieties in the Dead Sea. But then they'll be the same. There'll be plenty of fish to feed anybody who needs food. Now it continues on in verse 11, but its swamps and marshes will not be healed. So areas that are farther away from this river, anything away from this river will not receive this, this healing. It says they will be given over to salt. Anything that wants to, to be healed has to be close to that river. You know, we can think of ourselves. If we want to be healed, we have to be close to that river. We have to receive water from that river, living water. Verse 12, Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. And this river will be sustaining them. Nobody will have to watch over them to make sure they don't die because they will not fail. They will bear fruit Every month, because their water flows from the sanctuary, from the temple there, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. It will be good for healing people. It will be an amazing place to go to once again. It won't be a, a desert. It will be blossoming as a rose blossoms. It will be growing all kinds of plants. Things can survive in that area, at that time, they will be able to. It won't be a, a, a dead sea, it'll be a, a living sea, filled with living water. And nothing else will be needed, just that, that river that sustains it, that feeds it. And then this restoration of the land will begin to happen. The healing of the sea, replanting of that decimated plain of Jordan that once was burned up. Now it's still a reminder to us of a, a a time of destruction. But then it won't be a reminder of destruction anymore. That time will be forgotten. Isaiah chapter 43. There will be too many good things happening for us to even remember any of the bad things. Isaiah 43, verse 18. It says, Do not remember the former things. In fact, we're told, don't remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? This will be obvious. Everybody will know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We read about that river. There will be rivers in the desert. The deserts will be places where people can live. The beasts of the field will honor me. 
the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Talking about us, talking about God's people. Feeding from that river, giving Him praise. Feeding off of His Spirit. And no longer will those, those cities, those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the fire and brimstone, they won't be reminders of the sins of the past. That area will be an example of God's Spirit, the power of God's Spirit to heal. To heal this physical world, but also to heal on a spiritual level. To heal spiritually, to heal people when He pours it out over all flesh. Those who receive Him will receive this gift. And the day of Pentecost is our reminder that we were once like those people, even those people of Sodom and Gomorrah, those people of the plain of Jordan. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Now maybe we didn't sin the exact sins that they had sinned, but we were once sinners. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 it says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is what we do when we turn away from God. You know, we, we take ourselves away from His living waters. We remove ourselves from them. And when we turn away from Him, we try to do things our own way. We try to find water somewhere else that we think can sustain us, that can keep us alive, that can make us happy, that can heal us. But it says here that, that, is, that those, are, those are evils. When we turn from God and we try to do it our own way, we try to find our own source of water, those are evils because any sort of water that we think we can find cannot sustain us. We need God's Spirit so this day of Pentecost is a reminder that we used to be that way. We were once turned away from God. We tried to do things our own way, but we've turned towards Him. And we've received that pouring out of God's Spirit upon us. We've tasted of that fountain of living waters. When we have Him living in us, we've, we've tasted that, His Spirit. And that renewal that's going to be part of the, the Dead Sea, part of this world, has already begun in us today. That renewal has already started in God's people. Let's turn to Titus now. Titus chapter 3. God has begun something wonderful in us. A great miracle that's even greater than this miracle of healing the, the earth. He's healed us. He's taken us who were broken, who were bruised, who were messed up inside, who were, who were turned away from Him, and He's begun to renew us, to change us. Titus 3, verse 3 says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, you know, seeking after our own, our own things, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. This is done through Christ, through His sacrifice. Because of His sacrifice, we're washed clean, we're prepared to receive that Spirit. Verse 7 that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's what God has begun in us, that hope of eternal life. He has placed in us. He says that we have a down payment, a little bit of that eternal life living in us when we stay close to that river. And this water is capable of helping us to change, of guiding us, so that we can follow the example of our elder brother who came before us. To live a sinless life. And instead of being a reminder of, of those who have rejected God, this, this healing will be a reminder of God's Spirit and His power. Let's turn to one more scripture, Romans chapter 8. Romans 
Romans chapter 8, we'll read verse 11. It says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, that proceeds from God, dwells in you, if this Spirit dwells in us, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. God can raise us from the dead. He can give us life, and He will. He'll give us He'll, he'll give us life eternal, a life that will never be extinguished, that can never be terminated. Now, this world is in need of that healing, just like the deserts of the, the Dead Sea, the, the, the Jordan Valley. They're in need of that living water, and so are the people of this world. Both the, the land and the people need God's healing, and they need that refreshing that comes from His power, from His Holy Spirit to heal not only physical wounds, but also spiritual wounds, to open their eyes to the truth, and to also give them the hope that we have inside of us. It's so much greater than a reminder of the destruction of the past, this hope for the future. The, the healing of the Dead Sea is a reminder of the healing of the future, the power of God's Holy Spirit, that, and this renewal that begins in us today on God's Feast of Pentecost.